Good morning. Do you feel the love in this room? Is that incredible? My name is Nisha Zenoff. Before my son Victor's death, 38 years ago, I would never have been willing to stand here in front of you, all 1,000 of you, even to welcome you. I was way too shy and scared. However, honoring Victor's life, I find that I have courage to do things now that I would have thought impossible earlier in my life. We are here this weekend to honor all of our children, to share their stories, our hearts, and to speak our truth. And I would like to extend my welcome also, along with the others, to those of you who are recently bereaved or who are here for the first time. I can imagine that the decision to be here was a difficult one. And I applaud you for putting one foot in front of the other and being here. I also want to welcome those of you who have been coming for a few years or many, many, many years and who share so much and give back so much. And thank you to each of you who helped put this convention, co conference together and make it a reality. Can we just give them a hand and thank them? Thank you, Kathy, and your team. Thank you to all of you for the magic that you help create here. And wherever you are in your own journey, that's what's important. Some of us think of compassionate friends as our family of the heart. We've heard the word family mentioned several times this morning. There is no need for pretense here. We can be fully ourselves and tell the truth of our experiences, our children's deaths, and their lives. Recently, I spoke with Roberta, a bereaved mother who attended the conference last year, two months after her son Matthew died. And I asked Roberta, how was the conference for you? And she responded, not even with a slight hesitation. She said, I wanted to live there. I know that conferences can be challenging even in the best of times. But this conference, this weekend, as you've heard before, this is for you. This is your weekend. So I want to also encourage you to move at your own pace, to use that little breathing exercise that we just did any time, any time, that you want to breathe more deeply. I want to remind you to take quiet times for yourself and also, as Debbie mentioned, visit the reflection rooms. This weekend, this conference can be a life-changing experience. And I hope that by the end of this weekend, you will know how important it is for you to be here. And I hope that you will have connected with others who are walking a similar path. And even made perhaps lifelong friends like I have and others have. Friends who know you and love you at your deepest level. Regardless of your beliefs, you are welcome here. And thank you, compassionate friends, for all you do for each of us. Because of you, no one has to grieve alone. And I also want to thank my home chapter, TCF Marin, California, as well for their love and support. The Compassionate Friends Credo expresses so eloquently who we are. I'd like to share a few lines with you. This will be familiar with, for some of you, and please feel free to say it along with me. We need not walk alone. We are the compassionate friends. 
the children we mourn have died at all ages and from many different causes, but our love for them unites us. We come together from all walks of life, from many different circumstances. Here at this conference and in, in the amazing workshops, you meet many new people, but we won't be strangers for long because we share so much and are already so connected so deeply. Like a family, or like this family of compassionate friends, we can look into each other's eyes with compassion and know that we have each survived and are surviving the unimaginable. We don't even have to speak a word. There's love between us. Each of you is my hero. Even if you don't feel courageous yet. The conference theme this year, as you know, is the gateway to hope and healing. Now, some of you may be thinking, hope and healing? You must be kidding. I remember when Victor died 38 years ago, I had no hope and didn't want any healing because I believed erroneously that any healing would separate me further from Victor, from his life, from my memories of him. But that has not been my experience, quite the opposite. This conference gives you the opportunity to discover for yourself what hope and healing mean for you personally. What do you hope to discover here this weekend? There is no right and no wrong. This weekend, we will connect to our children through our love, through our hearts, and through our precious memories. July is a special month for me and my family, like it is for some of you. It is the month of Victor's birthday and his death. Preparing my welcome message for you has given me the opportunity to reflect on what life was like in the early years and what it is like now, 38 years later. I remember then that life was way too long. Anybody feel like that? Just, yeah, I see the high hands and the heads nodding. And now, I feel that life couldn't possibly be long enough. Anybody feel like that? I am awed at the capacity for resilience of the human heart and spirit. I'd like to share with you some of my personal story and what I've learned over these years that has helped to comfort, support, and strengthen me and our family. In 1980, we were a blessed and a privileged family of five going about our lives in the San Francisco Bay Area. We had three children, Victor, Andrew, and Faye. Victor was our oldest. Here is our beloved Victor. I speak to you this morning in his honor. On July 12, 1980, Victor died in a hiking accident in Yosemite. It was one week before his 18th birthday. He was really excited and looking forward to becoming, as he said, Big 18. His sudden death shattered each of our hearts and, as you know, changed our lives forever. I felt like I had brain damage, not just a broken heart. Even though I was already a psychotherapist and a grief counselor, nothing I had learned professionally eased my devastation and pain. Nothing could have prepared me for Victor's death. Nothing. Even though I had two other children, a husband, a loving family, and clients, I didn't think I could survive, and I didn't even know if I wanted to. 
and I certainly didn't know how to comfort my two surviving grieving children. Many years later, as a result of coming to a compassionate friends conference and listening to sibling grief and love, I asked my surviving children for their forgiveness, for my not being present for their grief. I was so consumed by my own grief in those early years. In 1980, several weeks after Victor died, I attended my first Compassionate Friends meeting and experienced for the first time a glimpse of hope. I had never heard of Compassionate Friends until I received a handwritten note from a bereaved mother, Carol, whose daughter, Chrissy, had died four years earlier. A mutual friend had asked her to reach out to me. Carol suggested that I attend a local TCF meeting. No way. I did not want to go. I did not want to identify as a bereaved parent. And why would I want to be with so many other bereaved people in so much pain? I have so much pain myself. Well, it took several weeks for me to finally attend, and I even had to be driven there by a friend. It was difficult to go, but I am so glad that I did. I had no idea of the love and the compassion that I would find there in that meeting and for the following years up until this present moment. The meeting was held in a member's living room, and I witnessed what I previously thought was impossible. Bereaved families surviving, sharing their feelings, experiences, and stories of their beloved children. I realized there that if they were surviving, it was possible for me to survive as well. But how? Since then, I have been compelled to ask as many bereaved families as possible the hard questions. How do you live with a broken heart? How do you live after a child dies? I know that you bereaved parents, siblings, and grandparents are the experts. We turn to you, we turn to each other for the answers, for guidance, and support. Openly acknowledging our loss and sharing experiences and feelings can't take away all of our pain, but it does open our hearts and help us to connect with ourselves, with each other, and our children. We may feel lonely, but we are not alone. I would like to share with you one of my significant childhood memories. Debbie mentioned Savannah, Georgia. Well, when I was a little girl growing up in Savannah, Georgia, I would visit my Aunt Lena. Over her fireplace was a large portrait of a handsome young man. I asked my mother who it was in the portrait, and my mother said, shh, I'll tell you later when we leave Aunt Lena's house. Don't ask, don't ask. When we left, my mother explained that the portrait was of Aunt Lena's son, Walter. He had died at the age of 19 in a car accident on his way back to the Army base in 1943. Aunt Lena was so devastated and lived with such grief she never spoke his name again. Many years later, when her grandson was born and named Walter after his uncle, in honor of his uncle, Aunt Lena never called her grandson by his name. No one in our family was able to honor Walter's life because none of us could mention his name. Now, Aunt Lena's story is a painful reminder of someone who isolated herself and who didn't know how to reach out for support. A dark cloud of grief hung over that family and that home for three decades. And Walter's death became the unspeakable loss 
in our family. Of course, they didn't know then what we know now, how important it is to connect with others for support. And yet recently I spoke with a bereaved mother at one of our meetings, and she described herself as feeling as if her body had no arms with which to reach out for support. In Aunt Lena's day, they didn't have the resources that are available to us now, like compassionate friends and open to hope, hospice, grief therapy. 30 years later when Victor died, I knew there had to be a better way to grieve. In our family today, especially with Victor's brother and sister, Andrew and Faye, we say Victor's name. We talk about him. We share memories, tell his stories, look at photographs. His memory and spirit are very alive in our family. Andrew and Faye, Victor's brother and sister, named some of their children after Victor, honoring his life. We have granddaughters named Victoria, Valentina, and Violet, all starting with V, and a nephew named Victor. As I mentioned before, Victor died on July the 12th, and his birthday is July the 19th. This year, on the anniversary in that week between those two dates, I received a call from my 23-year-old granddaughter, Miriam, who was out of the country and looking at pictures of Victor with her grandfather. And Miriam said, oh, Grandma, I miss Victor so much today. And I said, me too, honey. Then it dawned on me, she had never met him. He died way before she was born. So this year, on those anniversaries, as much as it may seem impossible to some of you right now, I want to share with you that I checked into myself because I wanted to report to you what is it like for me 38 years later. And I can honestly share with you, as I looked deeply and felt deeply, I felt peace and love in my heart and gratitude for this precious life of ours. I discovered it is possible to feel both grief and love at the same time. Now this isn't right for everyone, but this is what I do. As I go about my everyday activities, I am open to signs, signals, and unusual happenings, especially during the week between the two anniversaries. On July 13th of this year, just two weeks ago, I took my yellow lab pumpkin out for an early morning walk, and I want to show you what appeared on my driveway, just in time to share it with you in this welcome message. Well, I blinked to make sure I was seeing it right, called my husband Steve to take the photo. He looked at it and he said, well, some things just can't be explained. He's a lawyer. <laughs> my son Andrew said, there's Vic. And my daughter Faye said, Love is everywhere. These 38 years have been filled with much learning. Just as there is not way, one way to grieve, there is not one way to live after a child's death. There is only your way, inspired by the wisdom of others who have lived this journey before you and alongside you. I'd like to share a few things I've learned on my journey of hope and healing. Love is forever. Now, this isn't just what I've found and discovered. Many of you have discovered and shared these very same things. I will always be Victor's mother for as long as I live, not for as long as he lived. Our relationship does not die when the body dies. 
They will always be a part of us. Not a day goes by that I don't think of Victor and miss him. My memory and vision of him has not faded, nor has my love diminish, diminished. Letting go of my pain does not mean letting go of my child. We are connected in ways that cannot be understood with our rational minds. There are as many ways to grieve and to live after a child's death as there are ways to love. There is no right and wrong way. The pain never goes away completely, but it changes over time. It is so easy to love our children, less easy to love ourselves. Grief can activate our inner critic and other feelings with which we may not be familiar, like rain, rage, guilt, and despair. This is an important time to be extra kind to ourselves, to yourselves, patient, and practice self-compassion. Grief changes us. We might look in the mirror and not recognize ourselves, but eventually, eventually, we have the power to choose how to live with our grief. We don't get over this, but we do get through it. By serving and supporting others with their grief, it can help us through ours, through our own grief, and our hearts can be compassionate to others who are suffering. As the years go on, it is possible to embrace life and find happiness and purpose, even with a broken heart. I'd like to read a short passage to you from my book, The Unspeakable Loss, How Do You Live After a Child Dies? Thirteen years after Victor died, I had an unusual experience that gave me another glimpse of hope and changed me profoundly. I'd like to share it with you now. I called into my answer machine and heard a message from a stranger. His deep voice said, please give me a call. It's about your son, Victor. I thought I must have heard the message incorrectly. My body began to shake. I knew Victor was dead. That was a reality. Yet for a moment, my imagination took over. Maybe. Just maybe, Victor is really alive after all. No, no, that's impossible. I returned his call. This is Nisha Zenoff. Are you the person that called about my son, Victor? I was nervous and trembling. Yes, he said. Well, what do you want, I asked impatiently. You're the Zenoff whose son, Victor, died, and you put a bench up on Windy Hill in his memory, right? Yes. He continued, well, one day a few weeks ago when I was close to the end of my rope, I went hiking up to Windy Hill. I had recently gone through a difficult divorce and life didn't seem much worth living anymore, so I went up to Windy Hill to decide how I was going to end my life. He continued, I always walk right past that bench, but this time as I walked past it, I suddenly heard a voice. No, it was more like I felt a strong force coming from that bench into my back. I couldn't walk away. It pulled me back. It wouldn't take no for an answer. Then, out of that strong force came the most amazing, incredible, all-loving presence. I know it was your son, Victor. He was a huge presence, larger than anything I had ever experienced all light and love. He spoke to me and said, it is all about love. You never have to worry. Love is all there is. Then he told me to find his mother, to find you and tell you that he knows you love him and that you are love, that he loves you and that you are never, never alone. Never, there is nothing, absolutely nothing to ever fear. 
It is all okay, and it is all about the everlasting all presence of love, the all presence of love that can never be destroyed. Then the force vanished as quickly as it appeared, but he said, something changed in me in that moment. I continued walking past the bench, and this time, all the way to the end of the path, I knew I would live my life. That bench, your son, that presence, gave me my life back, and I want to thank you. Then he was quiet. I was in shock and wondered what I had just heard. I quietly thanked him for calling. My mother used to say, there is no such thing as a stranger, just a friend waiting to happen. I encourage you to connect with those around you this weekend. Introduce yourselves to one another or hug each other without even having to speak. Exchange your phone numbers and emails, and then while you're walking down the halls, look at the picture boards and attend the workshops. There is valuable support for you here. You'll be amazed at what you'll discover. May you find the courage and the strength to choose love, kindness, and compassion. In closing, I'd like to share a line from one of my favorite poems. As long as we live, they too will live, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. Have a beautiful weekend. Thank you.